This show is brought to you by our generous patrons at patreon.com slash falloutlorecast. Robots Radio presents The Fallout Lorecast. Welcome to the Fallout Lorecast, a place for the Fallout community to come together to explore the boundaries of our knowledge about the world of Fallout. Video games are very good at putting us into situations we've never been in before, but sometimes we don't fully experience them. In the beginning of Fallout 4, we have one of those moments where when you first play through the game, it's pretty cool. You go, oh, hey, especially if you played some of the other ones, I am in a part of this universe that happens before the Fallout, before the Grey War. And it's, it's startling, but I think we just, we don't think about it very much. Most of the game happens after that. We don't give it a whole lot of credit. It almost gets mundane, but think about it. If you were in that situation, if you were one of those characters waking up on a Saturday morning, spending time with your family, the news broadcast is on the TV and it's talking about the potential of war and the terrible things that are going on in the international environment. And in Fallout 4, you are a soldier. You are somebody who has seen that conflict firsthand. Just put yourself in that situation. You have a child. You have a spouse. What would you do when the door-to-door salesman comes to your door and says, Good morning, vault calling. I'm here today to tell you that because of your family service to our country, you have been pre-selected for entrance into the local vault. The local vault, an underground bunker where you and your family can go, supposedly to be safe, to avoid the potential of getting blown away by nuclear bombs. The idea that you can save yourself, but at what cost? Think about in today's money, how much would they charge for somebody to go into one of these vaults, for you to have a space for you and your spouse and your child? How much would that cost? I mean, you're going to go somewhere for potentially the rest of your lives, a place where you will have food, a place to live, a community to be involved with, $10,000, $100,000, a million dollars, how much would that cost? And on top of it, there's no guarantee that the vaults would even necessarily be needed. It's not like you or I, the common person waking up in your home on Saturday morning would know for sure that the war was about to occur. How much would it cost? How much would you value that sense of security and a place to go when something like that happens. I'm not sure the numbers, the fallout games don't give us a specific amount of money and how much saving your family would cost in that world. And that's just one way to look at the value of that. But there's another side to this. Whenever you make a financial transaction, especially when it comes to something like the insurance of the safety of you and your family for the future, you also have to take into consideration trust. Do you know who this company is? Are they trustworthy? What do we know about the company? Imagine you're in your living room and the vault tech guy shows up at the door. He's got, he's got a logo on his shirt or on his hat that lets you know, Hey, I'm the guy from vault tech. You've seen the ads on television. You've read the newspaper. You know, some things about what the United States government is doing in cooperation with my company. You probably have some of that background. Do you trust that? Do you trust it enough to spend that kind of money for the safety of your family moving forward? Today's episode, we will be exploring Vault Tech Corporation. We're going to dig into the things that we do know about the company, some speculation, some things on kind of the edge of the canon, and we're going to see what what we can find out about Vault Tech. This is going to be the beginning of a series of the next few episodes. And what's the best way to frame this? This episode is going to be more like a regular, normal episode. We're going to take some information. I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to tell you things that 
I've found in my research and some things that I might be speculating about. But the next few episodes are going to be like mini-sodes. I'm going to take you through each of the vaults, all the numbered vaults, some of the unnumbered vaults, and explain the things that we have uncovered so far in the games about what, how many vaults there are, what the other vaults were doing, um, and the purpose of those individual vaults. So this is a normal episode, probably be 30, 40 minutes long, like usual, but look out for the next few episodes and then over the next course of the next few days. And we'll dig into, I, I haven't done them yet, but I'm guessing somewhere between three, five, 10 groups of vaults, depending on how much information there is about each of them. And we'll do some little mini episodes. So I hope you come back for that. So let's dig into Vault Tech Corporation. Now, who is vault Tech? According to fallout.fandom.com, another wonderful wiki about all of these kinds of topics about Fallout, they describe vault Tech as the vault Tech Corporation, which is the official name. They were a company contracted by the United States government before the Great War to design and produce the vault system, a vast network of complex bomb and research shelters. Now, the next section in the wiki has a warning. It says, the following is based on Fallout Brotherhood of Steel and has not been confirmed by canon sources. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel is not considered one of the canon sources, but it is a source, so it's worth considering what, what is said there. So it goes on to say, Vault Tech designed and constructed advanced technologies. It was a major military contractor before the Great War, and as such developed highly experimental advanced and secret technologies. In time, Vault Tech became so thoroughly integrated with top secret military research done by the Pentagon that it had practically become a department of the U.S. government. The company still remained in private hands. But because of its strong connection to the American government, the principal personnel of vault Tech, its executives, top scientists, engineers, and so on, had to be aware of the true purpose of the vaults and Project Safehouse. So like we explained in some of the previous episodes, they were tied together. vault Tech and the government, there are connections. There may be individuals who are, who are part of both organizations, but yet there was still a separation. And it goes on, regardless of the American government's directives, vault Tech's high-ranking personnel had no intention of submitting to a lottery and living underground with a bunch of human cattle in the intentionally defective vault facilities they had constructed. They had come up with a plan for their own people. vault Tech instead created their own private emergency shelter facility for the top employees and their families, removed from the larger vault network and kept secret from the US government. This facility is known as the Secret Vault. We're gonna dig more into the Secret Vault later. That'll be one of the uh, mini-sodes that I discuss. But uh, the wiki goes on and explains, vault Tech did not stop there. This private secret installation was used to research new, more advanced technologies that would benefit mankind in the midst of post-nuclear environment. The initiative included some extensive research with the forced evolutionary virus, the FEV, which we've discussed before, the results of which, unlike the government-controlled research on the virus's uses at Vault 87, was also kept secret from the government. It is known that the FEV stored in the secret vault was highly modified in an attempt to achieve its original goals and also avoid sterility among those subjects infected and mutated by it. That's another point. We haven't really discussed the super mutants, but super mutants are sterile. They cannot reproduce uh, in normal means. However, this modification proved unsuccessful. Other vault tech projects that were intended for the corporation's own use included the development of their own robotic systems, a special biological weapons program, the results of which were probably the creation of a unique race of rad roaches and a variation of the death claw. I believe this is the furry death claw advanced biomedical research on the effects of rapid cell regeneration, and even an attempt to create a model of power armor to be used by vault tech personnel. So none of this is Canon. This stuff is speculative based on a game that is not considered Canon, but like we've discussed with like the film treatment mentioned in one of the previous episodes, this might be 
a hint at what the writers are actually intending is, is really going on behind the scenes. Now, what do we know for sure? What do we know that is canon? Well, let's talk about Project Safe House and the Societal Preservation Program. According to the wiki, officially the vaults were part of Project Safe House, designed to protect the American population from nuclear holocaust. In actuality, they had a more sinister purpose, a project known as the Societal Preservation Program. So it's like a project inside of a project, a secret project. The vaults could not possibly have saved the civilians of the United States from the ravages of a nuclear war or a viral pandemic with a population of almost 400 million by 2077, the U S would have needed over 400,000 vaults to protect every man, woman, and child. Vault tech was commissioned by the American government to build only 122 such vaults. Now I'm not sure exactly where that number comes from. I haven't been able to find that yet. If you happen to know, where the definitive number of 122 comes from, I'm all years. Um, th I, there is speculation that that comes from a specific source and uh, I need to do a little bit more research to find that source exactly. But there's also some speculation that the number goes beyond that. That just happens to be the highest number we might be aware of. So we'll see. Let, let me know if you know anything more about 122 volts. So it goes on. The true reason for the construction of the vaults was to allow the government to secretly study pre-selected segments of the American population, observe how they would react to the stresses of isolation and how successfully they would recolonize the devastated earth and stars after the vault opened. Do you remember the, the discussion we had last week about the enclave and their backup plan to fly to another planet? Well, Maybe this is where this comes in. It goes on. Only a few pre-selected vaults would be used for colonizing the surface. They were known as control vaults. These include Vault 8 and Vault 76, which we're all familiar with because the game just released a few months back. In addition, most vaults were designed to conduct often immoral experiments on live human test subjects. This project was the work of the Enclave. We've talked about the Enclave before, and according to this article, they were specifically involved with the testing projects. So again, a connection. Is the connection that they hired vault -Tick to do this? Did they have a man on the inside? Was it a government operative who was part of the Enclave and also part of vault -Tick, or was it coordination between different people? We don't really know, but we do know that they were connected. It goes on to say the Enclave is a secret shadow organization of the federal officials and corporate executives that use the vault tech company to set up this sinister experiment. The Enclave consider themselves prime candidates for colonizing the world or recolonizing the world after a nuclear holocaust. And to this end, commission the construction of their own shelters isolated from the vault network. Now, if you played enough Fallout 76... That might sound familiar. The results of the vault experiments were intended to help prepare the Enclave for their recolonizing of Earth or colonizing another planet if Earth turned out to be uninhabitable. Right there. The go to the stars. The experiments were monitored by vault tech researchers in separate facilities. Sometimes select vault inhabitants, frequently the overseer, were aware of the nature of the experiment and also gathered data. The experiment may be considered a success in terms of the data collected, data that was much more important to the vault tech and Enclave scientists than a few hundred thousand lives. Perhaps they felt that the trade-off was mutual, as most of the vault dwellers would have died anyway, if not for the vaults. Although the vaults were supposedly designed with longevity in mind, many vaults had insufficient resources and are in dire need of repair. It is uncertain whether or not the vault tech vaults were actually supposed to malfunction as many did, or whether they were deliberately ill-constructed. Think back to Fallout 1. You in Fallout 1, the main character, are sent from the vault to find a way to fix the water chip. Did the water chip, was it, was it planned to fall apart and create a situation where the people in the vault would need to rise to the occasion to solve the situation? Or was it just faulty technology? We don't really know. 
The article wraps up by noting that the only known vaults to continuously function successfully that we're aware of are Vault 101, Vault 112, and Vault 81. Some of those might sound familiar. Their vault experiments were intended to continue indefinitely. In the year 2077, Vault Tech opened up an exhibit in Nuka World. If you play the Nuka World expansion of Fallout 4, then you may have visited this place. It's pretty cool. One of the purposes of the attraction was to draw in more vault customers. But visitors and staff were subjected to radiation, subliminal messages, toxins, and brainwave disruption as part of Vault Tech's grand scheme. Even in the exhibit at Nuka World, they were doing <laughs> experiments on people visiting. How morally bankrupt do you have to be to do that? Think about it. Families, children, think about it. Now, there are more details about vault that we can go into that we will most definitely hit upon as we talk about individual vaults and the experiments going on at those vaults. Uh, but it's just some fun, notable stuff that's worth worth noting here. Uh, on the same wiki, they have a list of known products. Uh, some of the products include things like, um, you know, general stuff like the vaults themselves, equipment and supplies at the vaults, uh, nutritional alternate paste program, food paste developed by Vault Tech in conjunction with the federal government. Uh, things that may be familiar include the Garden of Eden creation kit, kit or the GEC. Some of you guys might know what that is. We can discuss that a little bit more in the future. Vault Tech vending machines, Vault Tech assisted targeting system. This should be familiar. VATS, assisted targeting system. Uh, the Vault Tech promotional lunchbox. If you remember the lunchboxes from Fallout 4, Vault Tech t shirts, golf tees, promotional Vault Boy bobbleheads. Those were created by Vault Tech as part of their uh, marketing plan. Bobblehead collector stands, Vault Tech limited edition snow globes. Do you remember the snow globes from Fallout New Vegas? Uh, Zach's AI units, survival handbooks, including the Vault Dweller survival guide, Vault Tech employee handbooks, uh, Vault Boy's big book of laugh for kids, Tranquility Lane Simulation. That's a really good one. I hope you've played through that in Fallout 3. There's a few others if you want to drop into the wiki and check that out. Now, there are only a few known locations of Vault Tech uh, other than the vaults themselves for Vault Tech as a company. These include some of the headquarters, which show up in some of the cities throughout the games. Uh, cities like Los Angeles, Washington, DC, Boston. Also, as mentioned before, the Among the Stars exhibit at Nuka, Nuka World. And Vault Tech University, which plays a key role in Fallout 76. So the question I leave you with is, on that Saturday morning, when the Vault Tech rep knocks on your door, what do you do? How much money is too much? Do you trust him? If you have any questions about Nuka World, I'd be delighted to answer them. So I decided to kind of rearrange the order a little bit. Normally I do a little welcome at the beginning, but I wanted to get right into the mood of the episode. Uh, I didn't introduce myself yet. I am Tom or Robots. Welcome to the show. I'm glad you are tuning in. Uh, every week we go on about some sort of topic and then we ask a question and the community responds to it. Last week we discussed who dropped the first bomb. Now, <laughs> before I get into this, I, I, I apologize. I'm still fighting a cold from, I, I mentioned it during last week's show, but there's been such a wonderful response to these shows that I wanted to get another episode out. And so if, if, <laughs> if I still sound a little nasally, I apologize, but I, I think it's probably worth you know, continuing the pace and, and getting things going. So we got some good responses to the question of who dropped the first bomb last week. Uh, Dale plays uh, at the Dale plays on Twitter wrote, and he says, vault tech is a company which wants to generate a profit, right? If they were the first to set off a nuke to get people to use the vaults, do you think they underestimated the possibility of the great war happening so fast? It left the public with very little time to invest in their vaults. So maybe they did intend to scare the public into the vaults using a nuke. Who would benefit from the results of the experiments? Well, we just discussed a little bit of that today. Was there a larger backer out there pulling those strings? Maybe they both underestimated the response and their attempt to fear monger the public into their vaults 
backfired by the swift retaliation that resulted in the Great War? Wonderful question. I don't have the answers on this, but that's that's definitely worth considering. Maybe they were pulling the strings. Maybe things got too intense too quickly and boom, the Great War happened. And now we're, you know, we're, we're left with the apocalypse. Basically, we're left with fallout. Now, I got another response from Colby Follett. I don't know if I'm mispronouncing your name. If it's like a French pronunciation, it'd be like foyer. But uh, Colby, thank you for writing in. He uh, sent me an email to uh, falloutlorecast at gmail.com. And he wrote, I think it's totally plausible that the aliens forced the launching of the nukes. And I think they could have even been involved in the creation of things like vault Tech, the Enclave, West Tech, et cetera. So this goes into that conversation about how involved were the aliens? Were they really behind everything? Uh, he goes on and says, the fact that the aliens appear in all games, as far as I'm aware, imply that they are watching over Earth and tracking its progress in these hard times. Many people theorize that aliens created us in our world, and I think that conspiracy loosely carries over to the Fallout world. Who's to say we aren't all experiments of theirs? Who's to say, Colby? That's a great question. Maybe we are. Maybe, maybe the humans are on the planet because the aliens put us there to begin with. Who knows? Uh, He continues on and says, and and this part's actually really cool. We'll be listening again uh, in game tonight with friends. If uh, if I get a good turnout, I'll stream it on PS4. So watch my Twitter feed for that. Uh, Colby likes to actually stream the show while he plays with his friends and listens to the podcast all at the same time, which is super cool. Thank you so much, Colby. Oh, and he also wanted to give a shout out to his buddy, Nick McCain, because he thought that would be freaking awesome. So thank you so much, Dale Plays. Thank you so much, Colby, for writing in. Those are some wonderful thoughts. If you have any other thoughts on what we went over in the episode today or some of the questions from past episodes, feel free to write in to falloutlorecast at gmail.com or shoot me a message on Twitter at Fallout Lorecast, and I look forward to hearing from you. Cultural database accessed. Quoting New England poet Robert Frost. Freedom lies in being bold. Why don't we ask the newcomer? You support the news? So in Fallout 76 this week, what's new? Well, I've got some exciting news because I have been having a ton of fun playing as my new character, Derek, the good, good, clean boy, on on my uh, Twitch account, twitch.tv slash robots, R0B0TS. Um, you might have seen some of the pictures I've been posting on Twitter uh, of Derek exploring the wasteland. Now, <laughs> a few years back when I was streaming more often, uh, one of the things that the the people, the viewers of my stream really enjoyed was when we would play uh, Skyrim together and I wouldn't just play Skyrim and min max it and there's this thing that people do with with RPGs where they don't actually role play they just play it like it's a puzzle and when it comes to these Bethesda games a lot of what I enjoy doing is really role playing the character and coming up with a character that seems to have quirks and you kind of got to work around those quirks and it's possible it, it works out pretty well uh, the Skyrim character we came up with uh, was a kleptomaniac, which makes sense. I mean, you kind of pick everything up in those worlds anyway. But he couldn't leave a house of anybody, even if it was somebody that was, you know, a good person without having stolen something of value. Um, he was scared of horses, could not fast travel because you have to use horses to ride around on. But every time there was a horse, I had to walk in a big arc around the horse, could not go near it. Um, freaked out. He, he definitely had some other quirks and some other things. Um, we had a lot of fun with that stream. And so what I'm doing with Derek is I've now created this new character. I mentioned him on, uh, as an idea on the last show, but he is a good, good boy. (laughs) He's a good, good, clean boy. That's the way we've been describing him. He's very trusting. He's, uh, optimistic. He's everything that you shouldn't be in a post-apocalyptic setting. And whenever he sees a piece of soap or toilet paper, he has to pick it up. Um, he doesn't do drugs. He hates cigarettes. He he will pick up uh, drugs and alcohol in order to sell them to the vendor bots because vendor bots can't do drugs. So what's the problem with selling them to a vendor bot? Yeah, he doesn't think more than one step ahead. 
Um, he also greets everybody he comes across with, hello, I'm Derek. What's your name? And then continues to have this annoying conversation with them, which uh, for me is kind of fun because I try to make friends and a lot of people don't talk in the game and they just kind of look at you like you're crazy, which is great. The other thing that I realized that's super fun to do with Derek is play the mouth harp. Um, there's something about the idea that these instruments are left in Fallout 76 all over the wasteland and are just unattended and just kind of left places including things like a mouth harp that everyone previously has put their mouth on, but Derek hasn't realized that that's gross yet because he just loves the mouth harp so much that when he meets somebody new, he'll, he'll ask them, Hey, would you like to play music? Let's go find some instruments somewhere. I know where there's a mouth harp and there, and there's one near uh, Flatwoods, I believe. Um, <laughs> but we've been having a lot of fun with it. Uh, if you'd like to jump in, hang out with us, uh, twitch.tv slash robots, that would be awesome. I'm always happy to talk lore, discuss things we talked about on the show, or even just kind of hang hang out. I mean, the, the streams are super chill. I've been streaming most nights this last week uh, from 9 p.m. Eastern on. So feel free to pop in. You know, I may or may not be on every night. I, this is not a full-time gig for me, but it's just something that's fun for me to do to interact with you guys and, you know, role play Derek a little bit. Oh, <laughs> the other thing I forgot to mention, the, the last thing we did with Derek was uh, Derek heard the song, uh, uh, take me home country roads, do, 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 right. And there's, there's a line in the song. I'm sorry. That was a terrible melody. I did that horribly, but there's a line in the song where he go, where, uh, it goes, um, mountain mama. And I posed the question to the stream. I was like, what exactly is a mountain mama? So Derek is now on an adventure to find his mountain mama. So he's taking pictures with everything that it comes across robots, uh, dead animals, um, super mutants <laughs> asking them, are you my mountain mama? So it's, we're having a lot of fun. I hope, <laughs> I hope you guys stop in and, and hang out with us. Hello there, old chap. Good to see another of General Atomic's finest still eager to serve. Let's get the other bit of politeness taken care of, shall we? What the bloody, bloody, bloody hell are you doing here? You people are crazy. Holy crap, you guys are amazing. You guys, you guys, you guys. I, I, this is the part of the show I've been waiting to get to the entire episode. I was so tempted to start with it, but I wanted to keep the mood, you know, and keep that kind of gritty, you know, do, 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 do mood at the beginning. Uh, but holy crap, guys. So right after I launched the last episode, the show was released on iTunes. Now, iTunes, if you have listened to any podcasts at all, you know that iTunes is the most important place to discuss the show, to get it promoted, to get reviews and ratings. And I asked some of you guys to drop me some reviews and ratings last week, and I am just stunned at the response. You guys are amazing. In just not even a week, already with only two episodes up on iTunes, you guys have rated five stars 10 times and left eight reviews. And I'm going to have to read through each one of these. Please listen on. And if you were one of these individuals who took the time to go on iTunes and leave one of these ratings and say the most genuine, kind things, I thank you so deeply from the center of my heart, like the Grinch. It has grown <laughs> three sizes. Um, this is the kind of stuff that makes me feel like this is resonating, that you guys like the content and that I need to keep going. That's part of what has helped me decide to up the pace a bit over the next few episodes of like the mini-sodes with the different vaults. Um, it's also super important for getting more episodes out there and getting these reviews in order to be rated in the new and noteworthy on iTunes in order for the show to continue to grow. So yes, there is a little bit of, you know, like personal drive there to, to make this succeed. But more than anything, I am just flattered. Every single time one of these reviews comes in, I read it out loud to my wife because I'm just, I'm just floored. So let me get right to them. I'm going to start with the first one that showed up. Zombie Karma, five stars on iTunes. 
uh, says, I started following you on Twitter. I'm super excited. You started a podcast. I love it. I love that you are going beyond to discuss the lore and even more. Please keep this up. I'm addicted. Thank you so much, Zombie Karma. D Watkins 0022 says, I've always been a fan of Fallout lore and the concept of the Fallout universe. I'm excited to see a conversational approach to discussing the lore and filling in those gaps that make this franchi- franchise so interesting. The robot voice he does in the intro is just a bonus. Good work. How did you know that was my voice? I thought... Anyway, thank you so much, D. Watkins. Arvel904 wrote in and said... Well, wrote in. I'm still in the other mode. Uh, left a review that said, this is really the first time I've listened to a podcast. This is amazing to me. And I have to say that this is awesome because this is a very good review of my favorite video game sagas and very interesting for a person that is learning English like me at the moment regards. That just blows my mind, Arvel, that you are learning English and listening to my podcast and enjoying it and it's helping you learn more English. That's crazy. Thank you so much for writing the review. All right, we've got another one by ZTA Girl. I'm guessing that's Zeta Girl. I don't know, 326. In a world where everyone is mad at Bethesda, this podcast is refreshing. I'm somewhat new to Fallout, but I love Fallout, and I'm very interested in learning more about the lore. Keep up the good work, and thank you for giving us Fallout fans a place to hang out and learn more. You are very welcome. Thank you for joining our community, and thanks for being here, and thanks. I'm glad you dove into the Fallout games. Yes, I love them too. We all love them. Thank you so much. Uh, The next one is from Dr. Sushi, who's a friend of mine from Twitch, who comes and hangs out in the stream all the time. Uh, I've known him for a number of years. Dr. Sushi wrote in and said uh, in the review, uh, great in-depth podcast about Fallout lore. You can tell a lot of thought and research has gone into this production. Look forward to more episodes in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Sushi. Uh, Cal's 22 wrote and said, I've always wanted a podcast based on the lore of Fallout, and this podcast delivers. Tom is engaging and captivating as he explains the background stories and details of Fallout lore. Must listen for any Fallout fan. Thank you so much, Cal's. That means so much to me. Uh, And you called me out by my regular name. You didn't even say robots. That's pretty cool. Um, Swampman0110 wrote, I reluctantly listened to the show on whim. I am now constantly checking daily for the newest episode. Well spoken and paced. My only complaint is I didn't want it to end. Swamp Man, dude, I feel exactly this way about my favorite shows. I'm always just like, I I commute to work. And so I'm checking my phone every morning. I'm like, did they put another episode out? And I always know, oh, no, no, they don't put an episode out till the end of the week or whatever. But I always check. And I never want them to end. And that means so much to me that I was able to do that for you and create the same kind of feeling. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and there's one left, uh, the most, most recent one, Norm McNeek. Norm McNeek? I'm mispronouncing this. There are, <laughs> let me start over. There are plenty of podcasts about various Fallout games and players' experiences with them. This podcast is not that. This podcast looks at the history of the Fallout universe and what happened to cause the Great War. Highly recommended. Thank you so much, Norm McNeek. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but thank you so much to all of you for taking the time to leave a review. Um, Just like these, any future reviews I will highlight at the end of the show. Um, I want to give everyone a call out for just taking the time to, to, to just be honest, to, to make me feel so, uh, good about making a decision to invest my time in this project. And, um, the more I get to know you guys on Twitter and in on Twitch in the stream, the more like I, I feel like I'm, you know, <laughs> I found a tribe. I, I'm just being very genuine here, guys. I found people who love a thing the same way I love a thing and that we have something in common, even though we, you know, might just know each other on the other end of a, a microphone across the Internet. Um, I think that's something very magical to our place and time. And I think that is wonderful that it can bring so many people together. And I hope that that positivity uh, creates a better environment for you guys for, you know, for a show you can listen to on your drive to work or what we're working during the day or going on a jog or whatever it is you're going to do. Um, so I just want to let you know that I value every single one of you for listening. Thank you so much. And I hope you'll keep tuning in. 
As always, if you want to support the show beyond just leaving a review, please share it with a friend. I know most of us probably have friends that play the Fallout games and would enjoy, you know, listening to a show like this. So please share it with your friends, uh, retweet the tweets on Twitter, uh, leave a review for me, do, you know, do whatever you can to help share the show. And I'm going to make sure that this keeps on going. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. You guys know how to get a hold of me and look forward to the mini episodes. Check, check your, uh, iTunes or your podcast streams for the mini episodes showing up sometime in the next few days. I'm going to try to cram in some extra time this week to get more recording done. And if you want to hang out outside of that, check me out on twitch.tv slash robots, R zero B zero T S. And I will see you guys again very soon. Thanks for listening to the Fallout Lorecast. All sounds and music are owned by Bethesda Softworks, and no copyright infringement is intended. If you have something you'd like to contribute to the show, please contact us at falloutlorecast at gmail.com or follow us and post some messages to us on Twitter at falloutlorecast. I really appreciate you listening and I'd love to hear from you soon.